Amen. Well, our scripture lesson is coming from the Gospel of Mark, and it is the sleepy Jesus story. Um, and let's share God's word together. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in a boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to our great God. You know, when you're with someone who's competent, it really changes your experience, doesn't it? We've been blessed to, on our 25 years of marriage. Uh, before COVID, we, took, uh, we started taking international trips, and we got to go to Ireland and to um, Switzerland, and we used charter buses uh, for our trips. And those were really great, but they were also stressful because we got, you just don't realize how big those buses are and how small places are until you go to another country. And you see these, you're like, uh, how is this going to work? But we were blessed to have competent drivers. They didn't get ruffled. They didn't get anxious. One was like, we had this one road that was like this up a mountain. And there was no way the bus could make that corner with other people coming up. And I thought, We'll never live through this. But we did, of course. He knew how to do it. And uh, that is such a great thing. When you have competent and skilled drivers, it really makes you enjoy things. And, you know, you could see that the disciples kind of felt that way about Jesus because things were going really well. They were clicking along. You're bent over? Jesus can take care of that. You got a demon? Get out of here, demon. You got problems? Jesus is going to take care of those. They were doing great. You're hungry, but we don't have much food? Don't worry. Jesus can multiply it. So it does seem odd that when this big storm comes up and their lives are really threatened, that they are so terrified. But when things are clicking along and you're part of the group, you kind of forget that are you really building your faith in that? Or are you just clicking along part of the group? So um, let's watch this video that's a good little background on this thing. Something else for us to chew on about this gospel lesson. It's uh, David Stott's The Gospel as part of his little narration. Now after Jesus had been teaching all day on the Sea of Galilee, he instructed his disciples to get into a boat with him and travel to the other side. Now as we've learned, Observant Jews stuck pretty closely to the northwestern region of the Sea of Galilee. The other side represented everything that was impure, decadent, and sinful. Certainly not Jewish. Now the Greeks and then the Romans built up ten cities called the Decapolis to the south and to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. These cities were exemplars to Hellenistic culture and power. There were temples to worship idols, bathhouses, stadiums, theaters. These were all unclean places to go. Certainly they were all bad to any practicing Jew. Now remember earlier when Jesus sent his disciples out, he instructed them not to go to the Gentiles, but to the Jews. And also remember that Jews saw non-Jews as ancillary to God's overall plan. So Jesus was making a pretty surprising statement to his disciples here. The kingdom of God would now be shared with the Gentiles who lived on the other side. While on their way, the gospels record that a 
sudden storm kicked up and the disciples were very scared. They probably also thought that the storm was confirmation that they should not be going to the other side. Now, it's not uncommon here in the late fall and winter for storms to form very quickly and unexpectedly from the higher elevations on the eastern side of the lake. Within minutes, the Sea of Galilee can produce waves up to six feet tall, which can easily overwhelm a first century Galilean fishing boat. A trip to the other side soon became a teachable moment for Jesus, who, by the way, was feeling pretty relaxed given the circumstances. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Mark 4, 38 through 41. What? Jesus? Man, this is a mess. Are you a good sleeper? Most of you cannot possibly be, given that sleep aids are one of the number one pharmaceuticals in the world. <laughs> Most of us aren't good sleepers. and But Jesus was a good sleeper. And my husband has another funny story about us, that uh, in East Peoria, there was a bad storm that came up, lightning, rain, pouring, noise everywhere. And uh, they had a antenna, they had a dish on the roof of the house, and it started running down the dish, down into our, uh, following the electrical cord, pouring out on our dining room table at 3 a.m. And he had woke up during the storm, because he's not such a great sleeper, and he, he, it took him three tries to wake me up. I know. That's how hard I was sleeping. I didn't hear any of it. That's not good. It was good for me, but not good for him. He was pretty frantic, let me tell you, and you would be too, and all that's happening, going on. So we know, easy. It's not hard to understand what frantic is. We don't like to think about it. But, but you know, they were probably thinking to themselves, like uh, Stott pointed out, that they were on their way over to the Gentile, to the sin. They were danger, entering dangerous territory. They probably shouldn't do it. And this is proof. This is God's proof, will. That This is God telling us that it's not his will we do this. That's what storms are, right? They're, 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 God's, they're God's message to us that we're not doing right. We made a bad choice. No, no, storms are not uh, God's direction to you that you've made a bad choice necessarily. I'm not saying God doesn't give direction to you that you've made a bad choice. He does. But Jesus told them to go to the other side. And so storms don't bother Jesus because he is living in God's will. And if you work to live in God's will, friends, storms don't need to bother you either. Because storms are going to come. Ever since the day of Noah, when rain started, storms came. So storms, yes, they have, they're threatening. Yes, they're stressful. But storms can and should and will be endured if you stand firm in your faith. The problem was the disciples really had to take a step of growth in their faith because they were enjoying the popularity of Jesus, but they hadn't really accepted, it doesn't seem at this point, that Jesus was God and that that is an important thing that each of us need to come to as people who want to follow Jesus. A man was buying some cologne for his wife and uh, he went into the counter, and the clerk was helping him, and he said, oh, I, I don't have a lot of money to spend. I'd like to get a nice bottle of cologne for my wife for our anniversary, and the clerk was very helpful and pulled out a nice $50 bottle of cologne, and the man said, no, I can't spend $50, and the clerk 
okay, and pulled out a $40 little smaller bottle. It was nice. Oh, no, not that's too much yet. So the clerk went and got a little $25 bottle of cologne. And the, the man looked at the clerk and said, I don't think you understand. I need something cheap. I want to see something cheap. And the clerk said, oh, you want to see something cheap? Hmm? Is that what you're telling me? Yes, the man said. Finally, you're understanding. And so the clerk slid over the makeup mirror. <sighs> You'll get it. <laughs> it's hard to take a look at ourselves. And we don't always like what we see because we get stressed out. We get anxious and concerned. We don't keep our faith. And uh, the disciples had to take a hard look at themselves, not because they got scared during a storm. That's okay. God gives you fear for a reason. If a tornado is coming, Midwest dads, you might need to go to the cellar. Our family would go out. It wasn't my dad. I can't blame him. It was my Midwest mom. We like to go out and see, where is it? How far is it coming to us? <laughs> no. <laughs> So it's okay. Fear is okay. Passions are a gift from God. The storm isn't the problem. It's our reaction and our trust in God that's the problem. Friends, don't let storms take you down. And it's not physical. Don't let them take you down in your faith. Because Jesus calms storms. Wow, Jesus, you can do it. Of course he can. And um, when we don't claim the calm that Jesus is offering us, it's not because we get anxious necessarily, but it's because we might curse God. And you might not realize you're cursing God, but when you say to God, you don't love me enough to take care of me, that is cursing God. That is blasphemy. You know, God gives us all sorts of events so we can draw closer to him. He wants us to be the great people that he calls us to be. Now, many of us have storms. They might not be physical. Maybe they're inside us like passions. That's a big problem for a lot of people. But passion is a gift from God. It's a gift from God to be attracted to another person. That's a gift from God. But if you let it get completely out of control like a storm, then it can really hurt you and hurt other people. And that's not God's will for you. God's will for you is to take that and direct it toward the gift of the person God has brought into your life in a covenantal relationship. I, I so appreciate today that my husband but that I was, did not know what was doing. He told me that the, the mayor needed to talk to him about being on a town committee. That's where he was going on Thursday night to come over here. And I was like, dude, if you don't think I know this town better than that, <laughs> you really don't know <laughs> me at all. So what I, I've learned in marriage that if you want to have fun surprises, friends, give them some space. <laughs> Don't ask too many questions. <laughs> but, you know, God doesn't remove uh, passion from us or envy or jealousy or fear. We need our fear. You need to be afraid of a snake or, or something dangerous. That's a gift from God for you. But you also need to be calm about it and control it. And so if you find passions are getting out of control in parts of your life, talk to God about it. Give that whatever to him and then see how he can help you uh, change. And, and the first thing probably he'll do is want you to be grateful for the things that are around you. Be grateful you have Jesus with you, people. Be grateful that, you know, disciples, be grateful that you are in a boat and, and that you have resources. Be grateful for all the different things. And stand firm. Stand firm and hold fast. If Jesus said, we're going to the other side, you're going to the other side. So when rocky things happen, please don't curse God. Don't say to God, you don't care about me. The cross always is the greatest evidence that that is a lie. 
God cares about you. And he wants you to live a wonderful, joyful life. And he wants you to have calm. And you can claim the calm when you open your heart up that God is big enough to take care of you. That he's the rock on which you can stand. Let's pray together. Loving and gracious God, help each of us to grow in whatever area you'd have us to today. Let's chew on these facts that Jesus was taking the kingdom out to the Gentiles, to dangerous areas that were not clean. You call us to do the same thing. But not to lose our faith, but to grow deeper in it. But that won't happen if we don't know who you really are. If we don't claim that you are our God and that you are in control, and that you do love us and bless us. Lord, give us signs today, and be patient with us. We thank you that you are so patient with us. But help us today, especially, to love the people that are in our lives, because that's where love starts, uh, to control our passions and transform them to good, uh, as you intend, and, and to live a blessed life. Because that's your will for us in Jesus. We don't want to have no faith, Lord. We may only have the faith the size of a mustard seed. But that's enough to move mountains. Live in us, Lord, as we seek to live in you today. And all God's people say, Amen.